Right, it's the first session after lunch, so I can make the usual joke, which I do and say uh, I have the tendency that people start falling asleep during my, well, my presentations, and actually when I said last time there were two people which fall asleep. So I say this again, and maybe this time it doesn't happen because uh, well, we call it cross-industry demands for collaboration opportunities in open source for safety critical systems, so we need to address more than automotive, and I'm the automotive guy mainly. So I brought also very good support from Olivier, who will take some part of the presentation as well, and by this we maybe also prevent people from sleeping. So what you will expect and can see today is two parts. Uh, who is familiar with safety within the audience? A few, that's good. So something new for those which are not. So you get a basic idea what safety standards are there, or safety integrity standards. Uh, what are similarities and differences, which will be interesting because that's the room where can you collaborate from cross industries or where you maybe talk a different language. Um, they say, share all similar challenges to open source. And ELISA project is one of the projects within the Linux Foundation which enables a collaboration across these industries. And we want to show you then in part two where this actually gets into practice. So what we deliver as a project, what we work on, which working groups we have, how this gets into the systems work group, how important education is, and the role of documentation. A few words about myself. So before I hand over to Olivier, I recently changed to ETARS. There was always the Bosch icon before, so I've seen a presentation earlier. Uh, ETARS is a 100% subsidiary of Bosch, and they just took me there as community manager not sure what it actually describes, but I'm basically doing what I've done before. And second part is the ELISA project where I'm very active in. I'm technical steering committee chair for two years now, more or less. I lead the system work group. I'm trying to get more momentum on the automotive work group again. And I'm also still an inaugural advisory board member of the Linux Foundation Europe, which was founded more or less two years back. And all this most likely because I'm OSS enthusiast and a promoter. Yeah, and by this, I give the first hand over to Olivier. Thank you, Philippe. So I'm Olivier Charrier. I'm functional safety specialist within Wind River. And I'm also an ELISA ambassador, uh, which is one of the reasons that I'm here with Philippe. Uh, I'm also working in some, uh, I would say, standardization committee, like with SAA Rank. So here with the APEX, which is more for the aerospace market. And uh, I'm also an OSS enthusiast, working with, for example, the, the GNU technology since 30 years now. I was happy to work with that. And I remember as well 25 years ago when I installed my first Mandrake Linux, for those of you that remember. So I didn't dare to say promoter because Philip is another range compared to me. So the first part we are going to talk about is to set up the ground around safety and what we have to achieve in order to be able to bring open source software into safety critical equipment. So the start point is why would you think that it would be interesting to bring open source software to safety critical equipment? So I, I'm sure you have all noticed that in the past years, usually innovation is built first with open source software. And also a lot of prototyping in done, is done in a lot of companies with open source software, with Linux in particular. So the question was that at some point when you start to make a good study, good innovation, good prototyping, why would you want to move to a commercial or another solution in order to be able to bring in a safety critical system? Why can't you use what you did directly with a safety critical grade? So that's one of the ideas in mind. And also there's something very interesting, and, and we will talk a little bit about it later, is we are at a moment of consolidation. So putting multiple software all together because of the capabilities of the computing hardware that we have, and the open source software can provide the means to do that. So we have a match here with all what we need, all exists in open source software. We just need to do the final step for safety 
in there. So that's the general idea. And when we talk about consolidation, one of the aspects, one of the goal is to reduce the space, weight, power, and cabling. And usually you start by using time and space partitioning a kind of technology to do that, and also resource partitioning that you do. Uh, if you talk to the aerospace defense guy, they are doing that for 20 years now. Uh, and now, the, but they were not using it with open source software. The good thing is now everyone can do it with open source software. So that, that's the good rationale about what, what we are going to talk about today. So to set up the grounds, we can start by the big picture. What is safety? So you can find several definitions about safety, some quite detailed uh, in order to work with standards and things like that. I think what you need to keep in mind about safety to not mix it up with security because there are some confusion sometimes. Safety is about preventing to hurt or kill people. That's the start point. And for that, you are going to make risk analysis and you will have to define acceptable and non-acceptable risk. And for that, there is no rule. It depends on the context, it depends on the people. So for example, when you will get out of that building, what is the risk that a boat will fall on your head? You can say that, yeah, it's almost null. But if you're in an arbor when they are repairing boats, that can happen. So here the context or the location is important for the risk analysis. The other thing is when you cross the road, you can get hit by your car. So there are some safety process put in place with the traffic lights. So you can wait in order to share the road with a car and serialize the access. But you have people that can cross without watching. It's just that the decision on acceptable risk is different. And we start to touch something about acceptable risk. When you prove for safety, which risk was taken into account? So the documentation and what you can bring is going to be important for that. Let's go a little bit in the detail. What's functional safety? So we were talking about the global safety before, but functional safety is you have an equipment that start to deliver function. So it could be a very big thing like an aircraft, a car, uh, a robot in an assembly plant or something like that, that can deliver function, or it could be a subsystem of that big one. So usually the idea is to see by the function of this equipment, what are the potential risks to hurt or kill people. So you go down, you can see that from a safety, you, you flow down from the big picture, the big devices down to the level of detail. And the work will be to do a proper assessment on that. So usually that's why you have the difference with uh, security or with high availability you are looking at things that could hurt people in the end. So when going deeper a little bit, when you look at functional safety, you need to look at a complete equipment. But that complete equipment is composed of several elements, software and hardware in particular. For the purpose of our discussion, let's go down the software part. So usually for the software part, obviously, the the software, you don't have a rule that, for example, the operating system should not kill people. That doesn't make sense. It has no interaction directly with the people. So, in fact, when you will talk about a piece of software, in fact, the good point is to describe what it's doing and prove that it's behave as specified and as expected. So here, when you talk about software, that documentation and the verification on, on this will be important then this piece of software can be integrated in a bigger picture with other pieces of software or with other equipment. So here, can the interference between this software and the rest could create some risk that will need to be uh, evaluated and mitigated. And it goes down in the end that you need to identify all the possible erroneous events. So what are the, the failure mode of that piece of software? because you need to document this for the integrator that will use that piece of software knows what he needs to be careful. You can dream on the fact that you have a safe software no matter what. Uh, usually that piece of software will be unusable because the performance will be so slow because all the protection you put in there that no one will use it. 
So usually when you build functional safety around a piece of software, you take decision that, for example, for some uh, features, so uh, um, um, Gab this morning was talking about the IOCTL function. For performance reasons, you don't want to make a lot of protection in it. So in fact, you are going to tell to the user, be careful, I'm not checking, for example, that the pointer that you are getting to that function are being verified. It's your problem at integration level to make sure that you only use pointers. But that's a decision, I would say. That's up to the software supplier to document how far they go in the verification validation and what is left to the integrator to work with. So that's all about this. That, that's what we are going to, uh, um, to, that's what we will have to build. And the final item, it's the proof. And here we're going to touch on, on what the industry are doing is how do you do the proof, meaning what you claim that it's safe to that certain level, how do you assure that it's the case? And this is where typically the, the industry standard you can find around are there to define how you can have a level of confidence that the claim you're making is correct. So here you have really a broader range of different standards that are made by the industry. So usually it's the industry people that are building this, this standard, whether it's for the industrial and automotive derived from the ICC 1508, whether it's the medical market, whether it's the avionics. So you can notice the particularity of the avionics market with this bunch of four standards. In fact, they have separated in different standards the safety analysis from the hardware safety from the software safety, while the others are putting them together. So, it, but in the end, here, you compare about the same thing. How do you approach safety? How do you make your safety assessment? How do you prove that your, so your software is going to be safe in the context of use and how do your hardware will be as well? And this standard, in fact, it's not sufficient. Usually you need to look at, in each country, how do you prove safety? And usually this standard, everyone talk about them because most of the countries have approved this standard to be the reference. So, for example, in a power plan, if you bring an ICC 1508 justification for your software and the requirement match what they want, then you will be allowed to deploy your equipment in that particular country. So you need to keep in mind that it's not sufficient to be there. Is it needs to, to be aligned with the auditor that will approve your equipment. Otherwise, you cannot install it. So when you look at all these standards, there are some similarities. Uh, between them. So here we can have about 25 slides at least about the similarities. So the idea was to keep the, the big one that if you achieve them, that's a good start. Usually they are requirement based. And the reason of the requirement base is the requirement is the intended feature or the intended function that you want an equipment or a software or the hardware to provide. So pretty much that's the start of the documentation. That's what someone that will want to use a piece of software or hardware will look at, say, oh, does it match what I need? And what are the limits? Meaning what are the input that I need to verify by myself? Because they are not verified within uh, the software, for example. So they are all based on this, that kind of contract with the user of this piece. Then we start to run into the proof. So each standard defines a set of actions that you have to do to bring confidence. That could be 100% code coverage, that would be multiple condition decision coverage, so that could be code reviews, that could be a lot of action that they can describe in order to bring confidence that your um, piece of software is safe from that point of view in the contract of the requirement, because it all goes back to that. And for that, you have a traceability. So the action could be different from one standard to the other one, but you need to make traceability to, to show that they are consistent with each other. So that was touched in the Basil presentation this morning, that you need to link the requirement to the design, to the test, to verify that everything is consistent. That's part of the confidence demonstration. And then because we're in safety, because you could say that oh, all of this could make sense when you want to have a good quality software and a lot of good quality practices can use the same. Here, the next step for safety, it's the failure mode or the risk of malfunctions. 
that's where the difference is. That's another set of documentation that could be an analysis, but it needs to be brought to the big picture. Like I was saying, the context of use, what are the failure of the wall equipment, and what cascade down to the software, how the software can contribute to the other failure mode. So that's part of a bigger picture. When you look at the differences between the, the standard, I would say that for similarities, if we take 25 slides, it could be 30 or 40 for the differences when you go in the detail, because safety is always devil is in the, in the detail. So here we pick up two examples that will have to be addressed a little bit. So one is about mixed criticality. How you mix up different safety level into your equipment, because mixing safety level define the set of action you do and the level of trust you have. So if you apply a high level safety on a piece of software and a low safety level on a, on a small one, if you put them together, what is the confidence for the low safety is not going to curb the high one? So each standard defines the old way. So that's freedom of interference on automotive. This is partitioning in avionics. So you have some slight differences on how you will address this. They have some rules defined. The other one is about tool qualification. So what is tool qualification? Uh, usually the safety standards are made to be humanly verified. So the different activities are verified by human. But sometimes it's tedious and people are bothered by that. You cannot find anyone that want to do code review. They are fed up with that. So this is where usually you start to bring tools. But again, it's for safety. So you need a level of confidence on that tool. That's what we, do. we call qualification. The way could you could qualify tool could be different from one industry to the other one, so from one standard to the other one. And sometimes you, you, the approach used could be different. So one example is the compiler. Uh, in automotive or industrial, usually you want to have a qualified compiler because you do most of the work at source level and you need to trust the compiler to not bring anything wrong when you compile it. And uh, as it was said this morning, usually the compiler brings something. So part of the qualification is to document what the compiler will bring, so you know about that. In avionics, usually they work at binary level. So um, uh, as it was said also this morning, working at binary level, you are sure it's always the same. So you don't need a qualified compiler because you work at binary level. But it's a choice, I would say. And, and no standard prevents you to present another approach, but you need to, to um, justify to the auditor that you bring the confidence level that he expects. So that, that's part of the differences that you need to take into account. Now, if we start to look at the community, uh, community challenges, so now we have set up the ground. Uh, in order for the equipment to be installed or deployed, you need to get approved and the approval is based on standard. So if you try to do another way, say, oh, Linux, see, it's a great quality, see, it's used in billions of equipment, it's uh, running fine. Usually the auditor will ask you, oh, does it comply with ISO 26262 or IEC 6108? I'd say, no, but it, it's, it's, it's a good quality. Uh, the auditor will say, I don't care. I want you to comply with this, otherwise I don't authorize your equipment to, to be deployed. So you need to fill the gap because the people you will talk in order to really use that piece of software in a safety equipment, you will have to comply with this standard or make this standard evolve. So that's where you can bring discussion to make the standard evolve. Usually they are made to, to be evolution on the standard, but if you want to deploy in two years from now, usually it takes nine to 10 years to change the standard. So if you want to deploy uh, easy, uh, early, usually you better comply to what exists. And uh, we, can, we can talk of the fact C++ was a good example. Um, so the, the other thing is, um, uh, so to fill the gap, usually you need to map what is done in quality uh, level with the open source software right now, because quality is there. It's just not in the form that is expected. So you need to fill the gap, either by explaining or translating or making convention, um, conversion matrix between the two, or by adding some tooling around or some additional activities that is going to fill the gap. So that's one approach that can be done around so processes, writing requirement in the way it's expecting, working on traceability and that, that kind of element. So that was touched this morning. We'll come back to, to this later on, Philip, we'll talk about what we're doing on this. 
the decision making process of open source software is not directed to safety right now. So each, each one is a decision making or an evolution. There are few chances that you will not have to redo a lot of things. So the, the, I would say the, um, in particular, when you look at Linux that evolve on a regular basis, how do you avoid redoing all the safety activities all the time? like every six months or every year or thing like that. So you need to take this into account as well uh, from that point of view. And uh, try to find a solution for that. The other point is liability. Usually when the safety equipment is there, it's intended to be sure it's not going to hurt someone, but if it hurts someone, someone needs to be liable for that. So they always will need to be a company or, or some people in between a community and the people that will approve an equipment because of the liability, because you cannot make a community being liable. So that, that's why the idea is to have an integrator or distributor that can step in to bring this as well. Training developers, meaning, do you think a kernel developer will really care about the heavy approach about safety? And do we need to? So, but that's part of the thing, meaning to keep the freedom on the developer to not do safety, usually you need to find a compromise. So for example, maybe in the documentation, they can add a little bit more information than the people that will take a component for, and review it for safety will see, oh, this has, been, has changed. So it's easier, for example, to catch up on the change or it's easier to make a proof or make some tests and things like that. So here there will be a compromise that will need to be fined because I'm sure no one wants to impose to the kernel developer to do, we need to follow safety guidelines. I think they will be bothered by that very quickly. And in the end, uh, that's documentation. Requirement is a documentation. That's the intended, that the description of the intended function. Uh, you describe what are the um, potential misusage or the aspect that you could not verify as part of the software. So it's going to be all about documentation. And you can see that in the community, several projects have taken over to be able to fill the gap between what is required in order to have open source software and safety equipment to be approved because it's not just to put it in a safety equipment. In the end, you have to make it approved. Otherwise, you cannot deploy that. And ELISA is the, the, the topic we're going to talk about. But you also have Zephyr and Zen. And with the combination of the three, right now you can address most of the elements we talk about. Even the software defined uh, vehicle, for example, the consolidation I was talking before. The combination of, of these can really bring a solution. And here, all of them have a safety working group that is looking at how to approach that gap for formal safety certification. And sorry, Philip, to have taken a lot of, maybe more time than to the rehearsal, uh, to give you the end to talk about the ELISA more in detail on how we move on this. Cool. Right, ELISA project. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Basically, what is it about in ELISA? So we have the focus of Linux, of course. We know that the systems look differently, and so we look into safety-critical considerations. We want to create dependable and reliability, what you can also see in one of the coming slides, what it means, because not everything is always safety, but it also falls into the credibility in a system, the reliability, will you use the system for your mission-critical thing? And for this, we have different use cases involved, uh, we also have a lot of industrial grade Linux distributors, Wind River is one, we have Red Hat on board and so on. So we'll see our members soon. And yeah, in order to prove this whole thing, we try to work wherever we can with open source projects together. All for reproducible system, which I will show you. And then this breaks down into deliverables, which mainly software parts, tools, process descriptions, and uh, documentation. Few words up front. This is my slide, which I always use because otherwise we'll come and sue me later on or so. So we, whatever we do, we do it with best efforts and best thoughts, but we cannot make sure that you know your system. We can also not ensure that you know how to apply processes. 
Uh, people ask typically when will ELISA come up with a certified Linux kernel. You need to have a continuous certification approach, so we will not have an out of tree module because we know the latest kernels are with the best kernel. We can argue about this, but at least it's a good thing that we always improve and always try to make it better. And of course, you have legal and other obligations. However, if this is all something which we cannot do still, we have a lot of supporters from different industries, different level of members, and they subscribe to our mission and to bring the things together and show why it's really cross industry. You can see on the left, there are the different use case working groups for automotive medical aerospace, and they feed into a system. They provide requirements and challenge what the other work groups from the engineering process, the architecture, the features, which are then put into a system, bring together and to generate output. Something which is not mentioned, uh, which is just starting. We also have a space grade Linux special interest group just kicking off and there is a Linux Foundation research survey currently going on and understanding and how this could be worse. Maybe you're interested from a company and a private perspective, so maybe then fill out the survey twice. Uh, and we want to see where we move forward on the whole thing because it's also here a system understanding, it's very closely related and it's really a, something which is called mission critical, right? It's maybe not the human which is on the satellite thing, but you will see what to do with the Linux part. And all burns down to that you have a sufficient understanding of the system. So, uh, and then if you have such a system, what is your role in the system? Which components do you use to fulfill your part? And are these components, again, sufficient? Do they have gaps? And I'm pretty sure you will find gaps because there's so much more to do when you work with the open source with Linux or just with your proprietary parts. So what, what are we doing on this? Uh, here we go. So you see three stars here. Um, in the handout presentation, these are all clickable links, so you can all get to the different parts of it. And we would like to look into workload tracing shortly, the KSNAV and the reproducible system part. KSNAV also get the presentation around here, I guess before lunch, if I'm right. So I guess it was already was. Uh, but for workload tracing, there's definitely nothing. That's something which is really nice because you can experience this in the documentation of the Linux kernel. So it's in the user and admin guide. And the considerations in there is basically that we analyzed the system and at some point of time, we couldn't get further down in our analysis. We need to understand what subsystems are involved, how you really interact, how often are system parts called. And by this, this was from the medical devices work group. They started in analyzing the workloads and have written down to the documentation for system integrators. That's how you can make use of it. But that's more on the dynamic analysis. You may also want to understand I'm using a certain subsystem call or a subsystem, and how do they interact? This is where the KSNAV part came also in, where you can really uh, figure out how is my relationship, how do things get together, and I'm still not sure if I have the right picture, but Alessandro can correct me if I took the call tree rather than the KSNAV. I just had this nice screenshot still labeled like this. <laughs> But you can see that you can see dependencies, where do things go, how do they look like, and this is something which you can do on your kernel image rather than running it and to analyze what is my system all about. Reproducible system where you can experience these kind of things is what we set up together with the Yocto project, Sapphire, we had AGL elements in there because we had the automotive AGL work, and that's where the different system parts gets together. So and the different work groups because you need to experience, you need to get a feeling on what are we really doing and that's why we came up with system. And also to remind our members that it's not all about Linux. Of course it's all about Linux, but <laughs> there's something around all about Linux. So that's why we came up and said, oh, you will have an Archos around. So maybe it doesn't make sense to put everything on Linux because you know I will have another system component or I can have judging. And you see this, how vendors prepare this. So if you look at the AGL uh, AMM slides, which are uploaded from the AGL AMM meeting, you find something more about these architectures. And uh, he can see basically where do you put safety. So there are concepts where safety is directly in Linux. 
then you have safety monitoring in an arteries, or you put safety monitoring underneath in the virtualization and then controlling, and then the Linux is a QM system, still has a lot of responsibility. So this is some different tailoring of it and can be derived basically from the architectures. Uh, this wooden I want to show, that's why it says it's not in. <laughs> And what we did for the system setup, we took the Xilinx hardware, a XU102 board. This is very expensive and not the most recent hardware anymore, but the Xen support was good, the Defire support was there, we had direct interactions and we could uh, agree on a common naming and brought this whole thing up in a uh, CI framework. So basically the sources are there in the systems work group repository. There's a Docker file. The Docker file is pulled for the CI, so it gets, generates the Docker image. Actually, this Docker image is used then to run the GitLab CI job, and then the images are generated. We did this before. In a smaller scope, you see it in the lower corner. This was the uh, automotive use case where it went into a QA emo image rather than a hardware, and then also in the QA system with this image. As you do not want to spend several thousand dollars for the board, I guess, uh, Xilinx comes with a very nice QEMO image and actually the physical hardware images which you generate also work on their simulation QEMO. But uh, we're still setting it up so you cannot experience this part. The other parts are all in our GitLab CI. The link is at the bottom, gitlab.com slash Eliza minus tag. And there are other examples. We currently look into a small Linux kernel configuration for Boeing. And by this are uh, all things tied together. The end upcoming part still is the system ASBOM. We work with the SPDX for safety together. Actually, the SPDX for safety SIG was a spin-off of ELISA activities. We thought it's the wrong place to discuss this in this forum, so we went to SPDX. And by this, there are different collaborations. And also here, the Meta ELISA was done with some project, the reproducible system part in collaboration with other projects, and where you see the little tooks. This is basically where we interacted directly with the kernel community. And this goes to the last part in a few minutes because we should finish soon and Olivier gets another slot. A few minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Philippe. You, 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 you gave a good word, which is collaboration. When you talk about safety, it's about understanding all the pieces you are putting together. And for that, usually one guy or one small team cannot embrace everything. So it's all about collaboration. And here you can see several levels of collaboration that exists between open source or communities or things like that. And that's really important. So we talk about Zephi and Zen already. So they bring the knowledge about a small real-time operating system or hypervisor in the picture to see what is the right approach when you want to put together a system. You can have the automotive grade Linux for defining what are the features you want on Linux to address in the automotive market. You have SOFI and, and SDV, which is about how do you approach software defined vehicle, how do you address the challenges? So which can put in perspective of what the avionics we're calling integrated modular avionics is how you can independently validate one part of a system and when you change an application you don't have to revalidate everything so that's also a challenge when you start to consolidate together so see the knowledge of this group will be important and then if you go to more deeper details which are important as well to understand you see how do you build uh, uh, a linux uh, uh, so the yocto can bring the knowledge on that. SPDX, Philip talked about it, that was a presentation this morning. It's how do you address this global traceability as well and uh, at system level because that's how far you can go. And Linaro can bring the integration of platform on the ARM technology in there. So you can see that the, 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 the collaboration is going to be very important to really understand uh, what's going on. And as soon as we move on this level of detail, you can go to the uh, ELISA seminar webpage to see some information knowledge. So that's all about the training, about the knowledge, that's about sharing that information. Because everyone will need this level in order to put uh, um, uh, a system together, whether it's about the process you would use, whether it's about the tooling you would use. 
and you can find all sorts of in, uh, information in there. And to summarize what we talk about, understanding all the pieces of the system is really the key for safety. And all the standards are made to be sure that you do your homework on that part. So that's something really to keep in mind and sharing the information and documenting and proving it's about the key. So what Elisa is working on is on looking on from a process point of view, from a tooling point of view, and from a kernel analysis point of view, how you have to address safety with Linux from that point of view. And typically, because of the liability I was talking about, this is where you will not have a company or a distributor that jump in to make use of this tool, for example, to finish the proof, to hand it over to be put in a system, in an equipment to be approved. And usually, as I was talking about, you will have to make some choice at some point to not cover everything from a safety point of view, but you need to document what you didn't do. I was taking the example of the IOCTL routine. For performance reason, you may not want to add any defensive programming in there. So it's a say, oh, it's your problem to be sure that the um, pointer you put there are verified and are not going to corrupt memory. And this will be the build of your safety manual. So in safety, usually you have a safety manual, which is the, I would say the, the start point of when you want to use a component. So for Linux, it will be a Linux safety manual that will start to say, this is what we have covered. This is what is left for you as integrator to do, to be sure to have a safe system in the end. And you can see that when we talk about requirement testing, design, and things like that, it looks like quality. So in fact, what we're doing here, as soon as the tooling, the process are there, maybe other projects which are not safety critical may have been twisted as well, just to increase the quality from that point of view. Because all the proof part of the safety standard are made our quality process, in fact, in the end, that is pushed further than the standard quality. Uh, processes. So if you stay there for the Linux plumbers, discussion will continue on Friday afternoon with the Safe System with Linux micro conference. So if you are there Friday afternoon, there will be more discussion around uh, what Elisa can bring and is doing and the discussion. So for now, if you have any questions. The 10 years was to have uh, it for everyone. Yes. <laughs> but at least at the start point of evolution of yes. the standard, usually that's where it starts. And that's where it And mm -hmm. the other one is, uh, so Boeing is also, we've, we've had an intern driven project called Delta Kernel that we've just uh, contributed to. Mm -hmm. So Alyssa, that's a change impact analysis tool on kernel changes, uh, but it, it ch does your change impact based on your specific kernel configuration. Mm -hmm. So it's not broad source based, it's based on your specific use of the kernel. That's the intention. Yeah, and that's a good input you are providing to the aerospace defense group. Further questions? Does that angle us? I'm going to bait you with one then. Why should non safety people care about safety? What does it have to do with everybody else I, outside of this room? I'll take it like this. Um, from a traceability perspective. So it's always, first of all, we don't go fully from a requirement down to the, to the code we know that we will start with writing some code and starting. But then we find it so funny and it's nice and we just write down the code and we do not spend too much time about the architectural documentation and requirements. And I had a very nice meeting once uh, where it was about traceability tool, a commercial provider. And he started the meeting with the question say, do we meet here today because you want to fulfill the standards or because you understood why you have traceability? 
And this was really something where you can say, because often we discuss if it's a bug. Maybe it's just a gap in the specification. Maybe it's not a software flaw, but it's just something that someone uses, a system has it's not intended. And suddenly it makes sense to write down requirements. And the other part was within the Elisa, we also started just free floating. And in the automotive work group, we suddenly figured out, oh, we all have a different understanding on how the system looks like. So then we start to write down requirements. And then suddenly we draw design diagrams. And we, by just exploring things with having people moving in and out, getting the understanding, that's where we see we need to document things. And suddenly we were fully in this quality management process and say, OK, it needs to be there. You need to have coding guidelines. And, and for things, this, you think this can save you a lot of time, but it also costs, of course, time in the beginning, but it helps also others to join. I know so many people who said, I will not use this open project, open source project because it's so terrible documented. Or others say, oh yeah, I can really make progress in there. Sapphire, for example, I heard the people like, oh, the documentation is so great. I can just simply start with it. And after a few, day, a few hours, I have my first things understood. And there are so many examples and everything is there. That's a project which had the safety thing in mind, while most of the participants do not have an interest in safety if you look at the members. This enables us in finishing exactly in time. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.